Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Stars of Italian Wine Night 2. So happy to have you here tonight. We have got a great jam-packed show for you guys and uh, really hope that the wines uh, make you all happy. Um, I'm looking for my friend Michael Young to join us tonight. Michael, are you out there? Right here. There you are, buddy. I was looking for some inspired piece of music for today. A little <laughs> do. Pretty cool. Pavarotti will do it. Yeah, buddy. Well, uh, many of you have uh, Zoomed with me before and may know Michael Young from prior Zooms. His company is a major wine importer from Italy, and he helped me align all the producers for tonight. And we have a spectacular uh, lineup of all-stars for you guys to check out. <clears throat> I'm zooming from our new headquarters, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Michael, tell us, wh who is Tob? So, I, so I, I'll go back about 40 years uh, where David Taub, um, who's the patriarch of our company, Mark Taub's father, um, the, his family was in the liquor business, literally going back to the day after Prohibition. So you guys can read between the lines, you can figure out what I'm saying. Um, so at which point, David Taub went to Italy, discovered this amazing grape called Pinot Grigio that up until then was never imported before and found a producer, actually found a consortio called Cabot and decided to be the first to import Pinot Grigio into the United States. So imported Cabot, uh, took off. We had even, we had spokesmen like David, uh, David Cabot, who was uh, a spokesman for Cabot for a while. Uh, it, it took off, as you know, Pinot Grigio became what Pinot Grigio is. We slowly added other fine wine uh, wineries around us, including Verrazzano, Verrazzano uh, Castello Verrazzano was actually the second winery we added. Uh, we added Travellini, which you guys will have tonight. Uh, and then last but not least, last year during COVID, uh, we had the incredible pleasure of having uh, Master Berardino join our ranks. So we, we import 97 different wineries from everything from Lafitte Rothschild to Planeta to you, you name it, we got it. We actually bought a winery uh, two years ago called Saracena, uh, which is a winery in Mendocino and, and we do our thing. We're a family owned company. Uh, we work with family owned companies and that's basically our, our focus. Well, I'm a, a benefactor because uh, I get to work with you and the portfolio mm -hmm. is spectacular. Uh, let's get started, everybody. I hope you got a wine glass in front of you. Hopefully your samples arrived. I know there may be a couple of people on the Zoom from out of state that we've had some problems with and uh, we'll keep working on that with UPS. Uh, but uh, we are very pleased to have such a wonderful audience here tonight and hope you enjoy our, our efforts. Uh, we've got a team of people that include designers and some really hardworking office staff that pull all this together. It's a lot of logistics. Um, we sent out over a hundred different uh, tasting sets and that's what we do at Zoom Into Wine and learn about wine as we organize these type of great gatherings and we hope you enjoy. Uh, tonight we're gonna be tasting Selamosca in number one. And we got, we've upgraded our packaging. Hopefully everybody got the upgraded package with our little labels on the jars now. So we got Selamosca, we got Planeta, We've got uh, Travaglini, and uh, you can correct my pronunciations there, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Rose, um, Cold Orcha, and Master Bernardino in the lineup. So we're covering a lot of ground, and we have a lot to uh, do and say. If you have any questions tonight, uh, use that chat bo box and make some friends and get involved and let us know what you smell, let us know what you taste, any questions for Michael. He's uh, our resident expert tonight, but we're going to be uh, playing some interviews that we have with some of the winemakers and um, tasting along. I think we'll have a spirited uh, night of great wine. So here we go with our first wine, Sella Imosca, and this is Vermentino, 
very uh, top quality Vermentino. And uh, we got this wine involved in our program last summer. We sold a ton of Vermentino last year. It was like the official wine of summer. And I think we're almost there. You know, spring kind of wakes people up to white wines again. And this wine just kind of brings it in. This is such a great wine with all of our seasonal foods and uh, the spirit of California. I just think this wine connects everything that's you know great in food and hospitality. Michael, what are you getting in that glass and the nose of that wine? Oh, I'm getting minerality. I'm getting uh, a little bit of flint, which is really nice. I'm getting just some really nice uh, stone fruit, some like fresh lemon zest. Um, but that minerality is just, I mean, it's striking. It's making me salivate. Yeah, it, it's that's it really does kind of in, entice the appetite, and and I smell all that salt air and that fresh, that fresh uh, Italian sunshine in the glass as well. Um, this is uh, from Sardinia, and we're gonna go right into a video with uh, the owner proprietor. Benvenuto nelle tenute Selle Mosca, io sono Giovanni e faccio l'enologo per questa azienda vitivinicola e questo è Monte Oro. Un vermentino di calore. All right, for those of us that don't speak Italian. My... <laughs> <laughs> He is... just said welcome to a beautiful place. I bet you guys are all jealous of me. <laughs> exactly. He is, you know, this place is like a, a blue zone and uh, every time I talk about Sardinia I, and I look inside a little bit more, there's no reason why you don't want to go there or maybe even <laughs> live there. I mean, it's one of the longest, uh, the population there lives longest in the world. Uh, they have an incredible life, uh, very uh, natural, undisturbed island, not a lot of development, not a lot of stress. Um, and uh, the cuisine, the wine, I love my Sardinian wines. Mm. And I would say, also say Sella Mosca is a good introduction to Sardinian wines. Um, Sardinian wines traditionally can tend to be very high in alcohol and they can have a lot of, um, a lot of oxidation to them. Uh, Sella Mosca is probably the largest and most important producer and they make their wines in a very modern style. So the wines are very clean. They're not as exposed to oxygen as traditionally they would be. Um, and they tend to really be, as you guys can see in your glass, a lot of purity of fruit. Now on the label, this is uh, <clears throat> Montioro. Mm -hmm. And what does that uh, qu uh, quantify? So Montioro just, it's a proprietary name. It, it means mountain of gold. Um, and it's also the name of the vineyard, uh, this particular vineyard. So the vermin so Selamoska has vineyards certainly uh not quite like planeta but they have vineyards all over sardinia hmm. and each region of sardinia has a different grape a different uh appellation and this wine is vermentino di galora galora is the only docg vermentino from galora is the only DOCG in Sardinia. So it's the most important wine, certainly. And and the, the Monte Oro kind of, ref, I mean, the proprietary name of the vineyard and everything, but it kind of reflects, you know, that golden quality. And I think it gives the sensation of, uh, you know, what are we drinking? It's Vermentino, it's it's pure, it's hay, uh, hay colored. It's it's uh, in Italian you say giallo palino, which means just pale, pale gold. Mm. Fascinating. Um, I, I I will say that uh, this, to my knowledge, is one of the top Vermentinos on the planet, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, DOCG. Um, they even uh, uh, make their own cork for this bottle. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a really stunning package in itself as a bottle. Um, I'll hold it up here. It's almost empty. But uh, <laughs> this one, just, it's a beautiful package and a, and a really uh, recognizable one as well. Um, they do make two quality levels, right? They make an entry level and then this one? Well, they actually make several different. So they make, um, they make a Vermentino uh, di Sardegna, which is basically the basic level. 
Um, it's from a single vineyard called La Cala, which is one of the largest vineyards, contiguous vineyards in Europe. Uh, they, which you see right there, that is the La Cala vineyard right there. Yeah. Um, and literally, you, I mean, it's right on the ocean. They may, they also make this Vermentino Galora, which you guys are having, which is a DOCG, which won, I believe it won Trey Bicchieri last year. And then they make a Cuvée, uh, I think it's called Cuvée 157, which we actually don't import into the United States, which is like a really, really high end Vermentino. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the American market, this certainly is, is a great introduction to a higher expression of Vermentino than, than you would normally get. Wow, that is stunning. Yeah, so that's the La Cala Vineyard. It's huge, um, but it's also, I mean, it's tremendous and it's its uh, very well maintained and, and, and really uh, they produce, uh, for, for $12.99, Wholesale, uh, twelve ninety nine retail wine. It's it's a tremendous value. And the wine that we're tasting today is uh, on the higher end, single year. Yep. Um, but uh, you said won Trepicetti recently. Yep, I believe it won Trepicetti last year. And I, I believe I'm never one for points. Just you know, I was a restaurant guy in a former life. You know, I'm sure you're the same way. Although for retail, we kind of just have to be cognizant of points. I, I forget, I think it got 92 or 93 points from James Suckling. Something really, really, a, a really nice score. Wow. Not a bad place to live. Seems like it's a well thought through. So here's another look at the wine that you're tasting. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. I think it's a great way to start. It's fresh, refreshing, um, appetite stimulating. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's basically no wood on this wine, right? Nope, and it's just, just pure expression, uh, stainless steel, and just really, you know, essence of, of minerality. Tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, fish and seafood are the key ingredients of a Sardinian, you know, local meal here. And wow, this wine with any type of fish, it just would be amazing. Yeah, I could, I mean, it's not, I, I always love talking about food and love uh, giving props to local restaurants, but uh, I mean, this to me screams out for uh, spaghetti botarga. So if you guys have ever had botarga, it's the uh, pressed mullet row, um, typical of Sardinia. And if you make a pasta with spaghetti and a little bit of celery uh, sauteed in all, only olive oil, and then with this mullet row, uh, just so, so good. And um, there is a really fun Sardinian restaurant in Culver City if you guys get a chance to go to it's called carousel um and it's 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 a fun little restaurant and I, I can't think of a better place to go and drink vermentino than that little place it's like a eastern mediterranean place right it's, no so it's actually a sardinian restaurant really they do like all the dishes are sardinian uh they have a pizza with botarga uh and it's spelled c-a-r a S A U. Wow. Oh, and carousel is the name of the traditional bread uh, from Sardinia. Outstanding. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that first wine. Uh, it was a big hit for us over the last year. It was the way I wanted to start off one of our nights uh, for our Stars of Italian. I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. Cheers, everyone. Um, my friends uh, Gina and Hector, the Sandovals are on the Zoom tonight. Mary Pat, haven't seen you in a while. I hope uh, TV Land is treating you well. And uh, Ether, thank you guys for joining us. Linda, you get the credit on the screen. I know you got the whole group there. Is Andre there tonight? Hi, Wendy Caldwell. Good to see you. The Fishers are here. Hey, hey. Good to see everyone. Hey, good to see you too, buddy. All right. Well, Terry Kamala, you got a big group out there. Hope everybody's happy. Hi, Jess and Garth. Good to see you guys. Fantastic. Let's move into wine number two. We'll say uh, some more hellos in a little bit. And uh, um, looking at some chat comments. So if you guys have anything. Uh, let me know. I'd love to, to see the chat. But uh, even those folks that didn't get the wine out of state, 
which uh, really sucks when that happens. Uh, tonight, and then, and then I'll be able to take so long when it does arrive. Um, we'll also be sending out this video at the end. Um, there will be a, a, a link coming out with this video. Actually, that's not even true. This video is recorded on Facebook and will be posted to the website now. We have an archive of all of our Zooms now on the uh, Zoom and Wine website. So I'm gonna show you guys that. And uh, just so you know where to look for it, because your faces are maybe on some of those. And uh, when you go to the Zoom into Wine, oh, nope, that's not the one I wanted to show you. That's my email. Let's go into the Zoom into Wine archive. These are all of our upcoming events. And uh, you can go down to the very bottom of the page and you see the Zoom into Wine archive and all of our prior Zooms with all the different interviews, different wines, different notes that you might want to check out. Um, we're coming on a year here pretty soon of doing Zoom, so uh, we'll have to do something special for our one year anniversary. But uh, the, this is where the Zooms will be posted. And um, this is also being uh, uh, simulcast, if you will, on Facebook. And so it's all on our Zoom into Wine Facebook page and uh, right there for you for instant replay. All right, let's move into wine number two and get some Planeta going on. Planeta. There you go. So there's the wonderful Patricia Ta. Island of Sicily is where we're at. Now, Planeta has a couple different vineyards in different spots here, right? Yep, so we have, uh, we, uh, they're very close friends. I, I, I've i known the Planeta family since my days working at Valentino. They were very, very good friends with Piero Salvaggio. Um, and they are just one of the most remarkable families. Uh, the Planeta family goes back about 600 years in agriculture in Sicily. Um, and Diego Planeta, who is the the father of of Francesca and the uncle of of uh, Alessio, the he basically started this consortium back in the day about forty years ago called Sette Soli, and the reason why that's important is because going back a hundred years in Sicily there were a lot of issues, uh, most of all the uh, the unmentioned issue which was in in cahoots with the government and basically what they were doing was they were buying grapes from small farmers they were paying them by the pounds and then they were selling them to northern italy to distill into commercial al uh, alcohol mm. um and and it was a big problem because it eliminated any any really strive towards quality so diego planeta started this consortium called sette soli and the way he operated was not paying people based on the the tonnage, but being, paying people based on the quality of the grapes. And that was really a step forward in terms of Sicilian um, Sicilian wine production and thinking of grapes as fine wine. So uh, about 20 years ago, Alessio Planeta and, and his cousin Francesca decided that they were gonna open this winery called Planeta on their family's property in Ulmo which is in western sicily just south of palermo and they hired any number of consultants um, to look at the land and they decided that they were going to plant international varietals cabernet franc and chardonnay from that point it was an instant success they bought a vineyard in vittoria which um, they were already operating in because it's very important for tomato production and then they bought land in Noto, which is southeastern Sicily. And then finally, Mount e there was a lot of talk about wines being made in Mount Etna. Okay. And this was the next edition. And they bought this beautiful property um, in, on, on the slopes of Mount Etna uh, in Chattanooga, which is basically where you have all the major players there. Um, and they focused on um, predominantly on Norello Mascalese, which we have in the glass, and obviously also for the white Caracante. Now, this is uh, one of the major grape varieties of uh, Sicily, and quite honestly, it's one of the hippest grape mm -hmm. varieties uh, in the wine world right now. A, it checks a lot of boxes. It's, uh, you know, Norello Mascalese isn't the first thing that out of someone's mouth unless they've got a little bit of wine knowledge. Two, it's... Um, 
it's really like natural wines, you know, kind of mother grape variety. <laughs> These grapes are grown on the side of a volcano. They're really into the spirit of, of you know, living on the edge, literally, because the mm -hmm. volcano's erupting all the time, and yet they're still living and, and uh, working right alongside the top of, of, of this volcano. And, uh, and, and these wines are, are from that living organism. And so this is just a really interesting wine. I love this version. Mm -hmm. I think when I smell it, it just takes me away to a place. In fact, you said tomato and I got tomato leaf in the nose. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, Sicily with the tomatoes, tomato sauce. I mean, Sicily is like, like an incredibly abundant um, producer of uh, produce and uh, that's why we have so many Sicilians in the restaurant trade and and, uh, and and they grow amazing produce that supplies all of Italy with some great stuff. I, w I would also add to I mean your your comments about it checking different boxes um, in terms of what uh, what is the appeal um, I would also add high elevation because uh, surprisingly, you know, from an island like Sicily, this is planted at some of the highest elevation vineyards in all of Italy, just probably outside of uh, Alto Adige. Uh, so it's planted at over a thousand meters in elevation, which you know is, is yeah. extremely high. Um, and then the other thing that's really interesting about these grapes uh, is that you, you don't have phylloxera on Mount Etna. So a lot of the production is either very old vines that predate phylloxera or vines that are planted on native rootstock. Um, and just me personally, this is where I get super geeky, but I am, I am a huge fan of uh, grapes planted on native rootstock. I think I, I, I am a firm believer that that changes the, the whole grape uh, when we talk about it, but I'm not gonna open a, a bag of worms here. <laughs> Cool. Well, I'd, I'd love to uh, go to the next couple of slides. I'm going to play a little video here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yep. So that's that's Alessio on the left, Francesca in the middle, and then Santi, who's another cousin, is on the far right. Wonderful people. Uh, open up that video on a special screen. Ah, oh, awesome. That way it'll play right. But uh, what do you guys think of this wine? Isn't uh, Norello Marscalese kind of cool? I think it appeals to you know, European wine lovers, it appeals to Pinot Noir lovers. I think it's got a, an elegance and a balance like Burgundy, like Barolo, like uh, all those things. And it's got a really affordable price point, and, uh, carries a lot of innate values. And so uh, that's a, a bunch of reasons why I think it's just a great grape to, to be aware of and to, um, to get to know. But with that, Let's uh, check uh, check out the video from uh, Patricia is actually from Hungary, and okay. she is the chief winemaker. Um, and just, I mean, she is a revolutionary winemaker. She's, I mean, I can go all all day about her, but I'll let her do the talking. All right, cool. Dear Michael and all the friends at Wine Superstars. Just a few words about Planeta. Planeta Winery is a family-owned winery in Sicily. Um, since uh, 17 generations in agriculture, in any kind of cultivation, um, which then in the mid 80s turned to a adventure in the premium wine uh, scene. Um, at that point in Memphi, which is under Palermo, on the southern side of the island, they started to uh, convert all their lands and they were quite a lot of lands because they, are the, they were the property of seven brothers and sisters. And today they are shared as a property by 15 cousins, uh, six of them working in the daily level uh, in the management of the company. Um, they've converted all these lands in, uh, in uh, vineyards. They started with some international varieties, but also with Grecanico and Neradava. The first hit was the Chardonnay, and still nowadays it's uh, giving us the courage to uh, go on with the research and development work, uh, which was the focus of the family once they had the first um, uh, successes in the Memphis area. They started a kind of a viticultural journey. They went to Victoria first, then uh, to Noto, 
uh, in each and every spot there is uh, a very clear focus uh, and, the, and the visionary idea um, in the back. In Victoria, the production of the Olivio CG, uh, the third floor di Victoria, in Noto, the focus was to find the best uh, nest for the Nero Davola, which was uh, born in this area. Um, and we have incredibly beautiful white soil, um, quite special vineyards here. Ten years after, we went up to the Etna to start a new adventure. And today we are working in um, five different contrada, uh, around 30 hectares in production, and we will arrive to 38 hectares in many, many different small terraces. The last uh, stop of this adventure uh, is Capo Milazzo, a tiny vineyard in the northeastern corner of the island uh, in collaboration with the foundation. It's a, a beneficency uh, activity also and the production of historical wine with a very, very small surface today in, in activity. Um, eight hectares uh, dedicated to the Doc Mamet. Uh, a part of this, the family has uh, a great olive oil production, which is complementary to the to the vineyards. So thanks to that, we have 120 people here in the area of Menfi who can work with us all year round, uh, which I think today is a huge value. Um, we are working in sustainable farming. Um, we are certified since 2016 for all the farms around, and we are converting in biological. Um, the um, hospitality is another uh, sector which has developed a lot in the last few years. Uh, we have two beautiful hotels, in the, one of them is in the middle of the vineyards, the other one in Palermo. Um, and about the cuisine, I did, don't even start to, to speak, otherwise this video would be only about food. Um, hope to see you uh, all soon in Sicily when the situation permits it. A um, few words about the Nerello Mascarese, um, edition 1640 Nerello Mascarese, which uh, you have um, with you today. Um, it's one of the, the crew uh, wines from the Etna. Uh, in 2016, the main part of it is coming from Shara Nuova. It's the first estate we have fallen in love with and we have started to work with. It's between um, 810 and 900 meters above sea level, always on the northern slopes of the Etna we are working. We think this is giving the finest structure to the wines, this area, uh, both for the Caricante and both for the Nerello Mascarese. In this case, we are speaking about a blend um, of 90% of 91% uh, of Nerello Mascarese and 9% of Nerello Capuccio. Uh, we are using a very long skin maceration. After the alcoholic fermentation, we are sinking the cap uh, and we are staying on the skin around 35, 40 days uh, for the cappuccio even more. Not a lot of movement to so have a very, very um, soft, very um, delicate extraction, but a long one um, to build uh, an elegant and compact body around the important tannins which the Nerello Mascarese have. Uh, for one year it goes then to big barrels, 25 and 36 hectoliter oak. Um, and then at least one year of bottle aging uh, before we release uh, this wine. I think it's really something which is um, fitting super well with juicy uh, meat, um, meats. Um, like a, a pork medallion or, or, um, or also some porcini. Uh, when the porcini meets with the, with the meat, it can be a great uh, solution. Hope you will enjoy it and hope to see you soon up on the Etna. That was great. Thank you, Michael, and all the friends. At <laughs> I cannot tell you what a superstar she is. So she is best friends with Ariana Occhipinti, and they just, to the two of them, oh, Ariana, oh, Ariana Occhipinti is probably one of the best winemakers in Italy um, and just a great force of nature um, and really a good flag bearer for, for female winemakers in Europe. And uh, the two of them are just always experimenting, always figuring out ways to better winemaking in Sicily. and. Uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed it and 
I think uh, I, I I tell everyone go to Sicily. You really have to go. Was planning a trip to Sicily didn't happen for us, but uh, I know a lot of people have been there. Um, we've been all over Italy, but that is still on the top of my list. I'm I'd love to pull off a trip to. Uh, uh, Sardinia and Sicily. It's not the easiest thing to do. Go to visit both those places. The transportation is not exactly linked, <laughs> but uh, it, it's definitely doable. Uh, we we love to challenge that uh, that uh, those barriers. So, um, but uh, I I really enjoyed this wine. I love it. I think it's a great example. I've I've tasted many different uh, Norello uh, wines. I have a couple of them on the website. This one definitely shows off the winemaking prowess and the capabilities when you have a wonderful winemaker wine and a winemaking facility that's built to win. Uh, there, some of the, these wines can be pretty rustic and uh, this one just has a purity and a freshness and a quality that really shows off a uh, great winemaking and, and a wonderful place and, and a big mm -hmm. investment in some top, top vineyards. So, all right, I think I'm ready for wine number three. We're going to keep moving right along. Um, what I'm going to ask uh, is uh, if anybody could put in the chat box like a favorite Italian restaurant because Michael is like a wealth of information when it comes to restaurants in LA and uh, his, his uh, chef background um, and his friends in the wine in the wine industry here in Los Angeles. He knows just about everybody, especially in the Italian world. We've already got a couple of votes for Scopo, mm -hmm. Rosso Blue, Musso and Ro Fra Rosso Blue is a favorite. It's my buddy, Steve, who yeah, was actually the reason why I worked. I left Spago to go work at Valentino, thanks to Steve. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've been to Macaroni Republic downtown. Musso Piccolo. And Fra I opened the original Piccolo. Ah, oh, awesome. Was that on uh, Beverly? Or nope. The original Piccolo was on Five Dudley uh, in yeah. Venice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. That's right. With Ant Antonio More, one of the most talented guys in the business. Very cool. All right. Let's move into wine number three. You guys keep throwing up those Italian restaurant names. Um, I'm going to go out for dinner. My wife's birthday is coming up. It's going to be our, our first big excursion. We got our vaccines. We're about 20 days in. And uh, we're going to head out to um, 71 Above, opened on the 72nd floor. Ooh, nice. The rooftop. It's going to be outdoors and uh, pretty crazy. Hopefully, there's not a lot of wind. I don't want to be a, the first casualty. <laughs> so, on to Travellini. Identify the Travellini Gattinata by the bottle. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sure it, it, it's a little bit out of context to, to be drinking in it from the tasting kits. By the way, the tasting kits are really well done. Um, but when you guys see the bottle, if you don't know the wine by its name, you'll see the bottle and you'll be like, oh my God, that's great. Gattinara. Mm -hmm. It's made from Nebbiolo. Gattinara is the name of the place, much like you call Barolo, Barolo, Barbaresco, Barbaresco, and Gattinara, Gattinara. Mm -hmm. beautiful wine region from North Italy. And the fifth generation of family, as you can imagine, our wine region dates back at the beginning of 20th century, more precisely in 1920, when my great-great-grandfather started to replant new vineyards when this wine region was almost abandoned due to a phylloxera plug and a devastating health storm some years before. The family implemented many and major changes uh, both in the, in the winery, in winemaking, and both in vineyards and in, uh, in uh, viticulture. Uh, pioneer research in, uh, in this wine region, especially when um, the third generation, Giancarlo Travellini, uh, inherited the winery from his father. Uh, our efforts and uh, the gen as the generation before us have made Travaglini one of the most important and most recognized wine uh, in Italy, but also the first selling Gattinara uh, all over the world. Uh, we are at the foothills uh, of, of the Alps, uh, of Mont uh, Rosa Mountain, um, 
in uh, the very, very northern part of Piedmont. And what makes the Cappinara very unique in my region is the uh, particular terroir that we have. We have a volcanic soil region and a mild climate um, that um, uh, that allows our wine have a very strong and important territorial connotation. Uh, thanks to the freshness, the minerality and the complexity that you can find in our wines. I take the opportunity to, to introduce you the Cattinara 2017. Uh, this is our flagship. Hi, this is Alessia uh -oh. from... Um, this is a uh, 2017. This, this beautiful wine is very elegant with silky tannins, uh, a great verticality, a beautiful complexity, and it's a very um, beautiful wine that can and a beautiful companion for all your meal uh, and all your dish, from aperitivo, for example, or uh, until a second meal. Uh, but also, it's very, very impressive and good paired with white and delicate fish. Um, actually, what um, makes this Gattinara so easy drinking is the freshness and the minerality uh, that you can find on the palate and the beautiful uh, stability on the fun. So, cheers! I dig the jacket. Yeah, I, I have to tell you guys, I, I smile every time I correspond with them because they are another wonderful family. And, I, I've known them from when I when I had my restaurant in, in the valley, and uh, and her mom used to come all the time and and uh, and and would always toast with me and um, I I have probably a good ten percent of my personal wine cellar is Travellini wines because they age tremendously. They're they're beautiful young, but in 50 years, this one in front of you guys is going to be world-class. Got a couple of comments that that video is a little hard to hear, hard to see. So I'll mm -hmm. send that out in a post event uh, email. It's a link. You'll be able to watch it on your own computer and turn mm -hmm. that copy up. Um, so we'll do that afterwards. I'm digging the wine and you know, this, this is a, a these are all uh, wines that will definitely you know have a nice shelf life um, you know certainly the white wine is kind of built to be drank uh, in the early uh, days um, you know five years six years though uh, totally beautiful for that wine but uh, the rest of these reds are just all built to cruise for mm -hmm. you know if not a decade decades and uh, this Gatsanara has some uh, so 2017, it's in a good spot right now. It's been yep. nicely decanted. If you have the tasting set, uh, we poured uh, anything that we delivered today, yesterday, anything that was sent out of the uh, city of LA GLS, we poured uh, winds, no, Thursday night. And um, uh, and they're, I'm drinking that set right now. The ones that we <laughs> today, they're in perfect shots, uh, shape. And uh, so that's, that's how these wines are built. They, a lot of Italian wines actually are better, like a lot of Italian food leftovers are better than the second day. <laughs> uh, and uh, Italian wines can definitely take their time at opening up. Mm -hmm. um, if and when you buy these wines, I would highly recommend decanting the heck out of them. Give mm -hmm. them hours, if not a well, half a day in the decanter and just watch them continue to develop and and I think that's where this wine's at right now. It's glorious. Yeah, I will tell you guys one of the best bottles I ever had was in 1968, uh, Travellini Gattinata Reserva. And it, it was breathtaking. And I mean, that was two years ago, not that long. So one of the things about Gattinata yeah. is it does not have to be 100% um, Nebbiolo. Uh, it actually is required to be 75% Nebbiolo, but it can be, a, the other 25% can be a mix of Barbera and, um, and uh, I think, uh, and um, what's it called? Not the Vespolina, uh, it'll come to me. But anyway, um, Travellini's thing is, everything is 100% got the, 100% uh, uh, Nebbiolo um, Spana clone. And you just see the vineyards are breathtaking. That's Alessia's mom, Cinzia. Uh, 
and they, own, and, they own a huge portion of the Gatanara region, right? This is like, yep, they own fifty nine out of a hundred hectares. Wow. And they don't that we sell out of the wine every year. So you know, as much as they're a larger winemaker in the region, they're not a large winemaker by any means. Uh, Gatinara in a hundred years ago was actually a bigger wine region than Barolo, and now it's minuscule compared to Barolo. I think Fontana Freda uh, produces more wine than the entire. I know for sure Fontana Freda produces more wine than the entire region of Gatinara together. Wow! Yeah, this this aerial shots are just gorgeous. Really takes you there, and um, this Nebbiolo grape is really. Um, got a, a very different expression in each part, part that it's planted and here it's a, a, a little more tender a little more accessible uh, softer but still has great gusto and, t and tannin and structure and balance and just really is a beautiful representation and I see they make a couple of different versions um, this one is the Gatanara uh, the one that you're looking at the picture of right now but they also make a Reserva and they make a three vineyard vin version. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, and then they make also a wine very much like, um, th these wines, I would also compare more to Alto Piemonte, mm -hmm. um, than to Barolo and Nebbiolo, oh, uh, Barolo and Nebbiolo. They tend to be a higher elevation. They tend to be a little bit more, uh, stringent, a little bit more aromatic. And they produce a wine very much in keeping. That's Il Sogno right there, uh, which is basically done like Barolo. Mm. G great question. Are the vineyards irrigated? And the answer is no. You cannot I irrigate vineyards in Italy. No, probably no need. I mean, there's mm -hmm. years that are warmer, but uh, they still get their fair share of rain there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, those rocky soils just kind of you know, harbor and hold a, a lot of the water retention. So the vines don't struggle too hard for too long, and they certainly are survivors. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm, not, I'm not playing the, the video because it's all in Italian. If you want to watch this, um, be more than happy. I'm going to supply you in that follow-up email with this entire slideshow, and you can watch it in full Italian. And you can see the process. Yeah. But uh, the bottle is uh, very signature. Yeah, the bottle actually is meant to act as a decanter. Um, and they created that bottle for the 100th anniversary of the winery in 1950. Um, a lot of people, I, I mean, I've heard everybody has come to me and said, oh, I know exactly why they have the bottle. It was, they had a fire and the bottles melted, but only partially melted. And then the other one I heard is like, I guess it was a Maradona fan was like, oh, it was the hand of God that gently squeezed the bottle. <laughs> so, uh, the, the truth is that they had made, it was a design piece that they had made to kind of act as a decanter for the 100th anniversary. That's yeah, super cool. And I got to tell you, it actually feels great in the hand. Yeah, I've, I've heard ergometrically designed too. <laughs> and it fits nicely into uh, a box because they all kind of line up really nicely. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's smart packaging because it's so signature. It's good for bins. It's not good for racks. Yeah. A little tough on the rack. Really cool. So again, uh, way up here in Piedmont, this is Piedmont up here, real close to, you know, the French border, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the mountainous region, um, incredible minerality, incredible rain, snow, extremes. Mm. The extremes really make the wine very interesting and uh, their lifestyle, very interesting too. It's really an amazing spot. Yeah, and you know, one of the things you'll hear wine, you know, wine people talk about is diurnal shifts. Um, and this is a perfect example where, you know, because of the high elevation, you get a, a really con a concentrated sunlight during the day. And at nighttime, you have winds that blow off the glacier and cool down the vineyards. So you get this tension in the grapes, you know, thick skin, and and developed um, developed uh, fruit and seed structure, um, and really produces some wines that are very well structured, age worthy, and and tremendously balanced. Really good shot of the bottle there. Yeah. Low alcohol, twelve point five percent alcohol. 
Um, you know, these wines age, you know, considering how, how long it takes to make these wines, you know, that they have to age 36 months, you know, and you work backwards, you know, $29.99 retail for a wine that it takes three to four years to make is a pretty good deal. Why Slavonian oak? Great question. Um, so first I will, I will thank you for spelling it right because usually people will say, you know, oh, Slovenian um, oak, and it's not Slovenian, it's Slavonian. And Slavonian is the, is the oak forest that runs from Northern Italy all the way into um, Albania and into the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia, obviously. And, and the reason why Slo uh, Slavonian oak is because those are the forests that are the most easily accessible. Um, traditionally, it, it's, it's also great for winemaking because it has a really tight um, grain, so it's less permeable. Um, and then you, you, sometimes you will see, I mean, 99.99% of the time it's Slavonian oak in Italy, particularly Northern Italy, but you will see a little bit also of chestnut uh, used traditionally for winemaking. I, I thought it was uh, amazing. Has, what I what really love about it has this really long expression of uh, of uh, uh, like these saffron cinnamon kind of uh, scents. Mm. I just love it. Yeah, it's definitely a spice and you know minerality type of a wine, and and I love that mouthfeel. So really, I, I, I invite you guys to experiment with some wines from what's called the Alto Piemonte, which is the more northern expression of Piedmont. Uh, Lesona is another wine you'll see. Gattinara, obviously, we talked about. Bramatera is another one. Uh, Costa de la Cecia is another one. And they're all different expressions of, of Nebbiolo in this particular, uh, with the Geme. Uh, clone Geme is another, or Spana clone Geme clone, but Geme is another wine also produced from that region. Spana is also up there, right? Yep. All right, Josh, what did you think? I know you were trying to chop, uh, chop. Sorry, uh, we thought it was really, yep, yeah, really nice. Uh, very smooth. A lot of interesting notes in there. Definitely dry. Has that has that really sort of old world feel to it. Uh, we enjoyed it. Definitely would like to have this with some food. Mm -hmm. that's the thing about italian wines if uh, you don't have and, and we uh, i usually say at the beginning of stars uh you know uh and kind of encourage you you know have have some food in front of you with these wines if you can because uh the, and there's no rules on the zoom you can eat and try to make us all hungry just show off your plate get something yummy um this, this you know you don't have to be on camera thinking oh, i don't want to make it, people uncomfortable that i'm feeding my face <laughs> definitely enjoy kent how are things uh back at your place i don't, i'm not sure are you in florida today that looks florida you're not in your cellar yeah and we're on lake erie tonight oh, in a wow. rainstorm Ooh, how cool these wines taste good with the rain mm -hmm. oh absolutely we can't wait for the brunello all right well, we're <laughs> almost there already <laughs> Cool, good to have you, man. On to Sangiovese. And somebody asked about when's the best time to open these bottles. Well, you know, every bottle probably has a, a, the most opportune moment, but I will tell you all these reds that we're tasting tonight will be absolutely more, more better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they will be, uh, they will excel with two hours uh, being open uh, and in, and longer and and they'll be mm -hmm. good the very next day too like i said the, the, these wines will just continue to kind of unwind because they're tightly wound that's that's all natural acidity that's coming off that those stony hillsides that is and uh and they 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 take their time um and we're going to go into uh, more intense wines now too and if you don't own any cheese or something like that just tannin alert you're about to you know, change the color of your teeth here. Get ready. I have a question for Michael real quick. Michael, on this, this last one we, we tried, um, 
what's the uh, uh, skin to fruit uh, composite? I mean, are there small berries or larger berries in, uh, for the 2017? So, no, so, so great question. Nebbiolo tends to be smaller berries. Um, and also just when they act, when they, something really interesting about how they harvest in Gattinara is the, the way the cluster of the Nebbiolo is, is it's elongated and it's got almost ears. So it almost looks like, like Mickey Mouse, but Mickey Mouse with a really long, narrow nose. Um, and because of that, what they do traditionally is they cut off the ears and they cut off the, the bottom of the grapes. Um, that way they can really get to the core of the grapes that are more evenly ripened. Um, because they're small berries, because the cluster is kind of odd shaped, um, they, they have to make an effort to kind of prune the particular, what are called grappolos or grappoli, um, to, to make it more evenly ripened. But they tend to have very thick skin. They tend to be small berries, um, and uh, and and that's that. There's a lot of grape varieties that you do that with. Uh, those the wings or the shoulders of the grape variety have to be clipped off because they're getting probably the most direct sunshine. They're ripening first, and they're probably more almost sunburnt or raisin. They're going to be impacted by the elements the most. And uh, what you want when you're making wine is homogeny. You want all the grape varieties to be pretty close to the same. You don't want to have green and sunburn in the same cluster. So uh, that's why we do a lot of extending, extended uh, sorting, and, and you know uh, that all takes a lot of time and effort and money. So the the more systematic and more uh, you can make the vineyard do the work, the better the wine will be, and the less wine making you'll have to employ. All right, let's go to our next wine. We're going to Tuscany now for Vino Noble with Trey Rose. We go right into a video here, Michael. And I'm, I'm gonna try to make sure that this is nice and loud for everybody. I think I won't have a problem. Good morning. Welcome in Trey Rose. Welcome in such a lovely place. We are in the southeast part of Tuscany. And this is an incredible place. Is that it's better? That's what I like to say. The prices, the let's try one more thing. The, the, pine, uh, the maritime pines, where the claim meets the, the sand, and that is in very incredible terroir. The Sangiovese, where here called the local clone of Sangiovese, is Pugnolo, can make such as a unique wines. Sangiovese is it in total inside how I have. I'm gonna start that again. I gotta change the sound setting. Welcome Hold on, here we go. Welcome in such as a lovely place. We are in the southeast part of Tuscany. And this is an incredible place. It's the place where I like to say the price, the cypress meet uh, the pine, uh, the maritime pines, where the claim meets the, the sand. And that is in very incredible terroir. The Sangiovese, where here we call the local clone of Sangiovese is Pugnolo, can make such as a unique wines. Sangiovese is it in total inside our heart and it is a, a, a mandatory aspect in our way of uh, producing wine. For that reason, the Santa Catarina, the wine that we will taste later, it is entirely made by, by, by Prugnolo Gentile. But another important place about this lovely place, Tre Rose, that means the three roses. It's actually that is a, a winery and vineyards are located in five hills. And from one hill, you can see the other hills. So that is an incredible uh, signature on the landscape. We have another second very important signature that is related to our way of uh, growing and developing the vineyards. So we have an architecture that is a kind of amphitheater that is a natural shape of the topography of these hills all around the Vino Nobile Appellation. But actually, when you arrive in Trorosa, you can recognize this uh, landscape signature that we wanted to have uh, across all our uh, vineyards. And the third very important aspect in producing wine in Trorosa is the organic approach. Uh, we decided a few years ago to become organic. We are in the hand of our process. 2021 will be the first vintage where we are entirely organic. But since many years we were growing, we were approaching our culture of making wine with this uh, organic culture. The wines are the place 
where the wines come from it is a quite old place it is a place that was discovered by a lovely villa that is just in the middle of the of the, the property that is from the uh, 15th century and another important aspect uh, is that uh, all our production is focused in the local clone of Brunello Gentile and our wines want really to reflect the Mediterranean climate that we have in this lovely appellation in the southeast part of Tuscany. Finally, I think that the best way to understand where we are and what we do in a very friendly way is just if you have a chance to come here and to visit us or you have another chance. You have the chance to taste this lovely 2015 Santa Caterina Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. This is a wine that reflects the culture and the, and the passion and, the, and, and what really every day we try to put inside, the, uh, inside our journey. The journey that we have is where we were focusing to produce wine that has an identity, a personality, the wines that really reflect the terroir, the clay, the sand, and the Prunolo Gentile grape variety. It is a wine that is made in uh, only just one hill, and the name of the hill it is Santa Caterina. So it is a single vineyard concept. Just the best clusters are selected to make this wine, and it is a wine that is aged for 18 months uh, in Slavonian oak, in large Slavonian oak, in order to enhance uh, the crunchiness of the wines. The wine express on the nose a very beautiful orange, uh, bloody orange character with some quinotto touch and there is a leafy complexity and a spiciness that is typical of the Sangiovese in this part of Tuscany. In the palate is not so rich and huge as a Brunello, it has much more freshness, uh, a lightness and it has an incredible drink drinkability with a very long savory length and beautiful St. Titanis. Two chances. One, come to Trelose, visit your house, stay with us for a day, enjoy the beautiful uh, wine making life that we have or, other, or otherwise you have a possibility to buy this wine and enjoy the lovely Santa Caterina thanks to the uh, friends that we have in the United States, TFS, our family selection that are made an incredible job and I want to say thank you for your attention, for your passion and for just pay a little bit of time to focus on Santa Caterina. Ciao. He's done this before. That's good. <laughs> so uh, that's Andrea Lonardi, who, uh, funny enough, I've known him for a long time. Also, he used to be the winemaker. Um, he used to be the winemaker for a lot of properties, but uh, he was the winemaker in Sicily at a property called uh, Rapita La. And then uh, he decided to come home. He's from Valpolicella. So he's also the winemaker for Bertani. Uh, Bertani owns, the Bertani family owns also Tre Rose, um, and then a, a producer in Brunello called Valdi Suga. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll go back into that slideshow and see exactly where this uh, place is. But this is a unique wine. This is always a, a fun find, a little bit of a farmer wine outside of, uh, you know, like the Chianti zone. It's kind of trapped between Chianti and and Brunello Montalcino, um, and and price point wise, this wine just always over delivers. It's a it's a real unique expression. It's Sangiovese, and uh, it's Sangiovese and Pronoto Gentile, right? Nope. So uh, Pronoto Gentile is the biotype of Sangiovese that you find in the um, in the Montepulciano region. Um, it, it's, it's very much comparable to like in Brunello, the, the biotype is, uh, Brunello Biondi Santi or Sanjo, or otherwise known as Sangiovese Grosso and Prunello Gentile is a, is a, is a biotype similar to Sangiovese Grosso, um, in, in the Sangiovese family. So like Pinot Noir would have Pomard clone and Nui St. George and, mm -hmm. and Okay, Moussini and all that stuff. Yep, exactly. So in so you have 26, um, uh, sorry, 36 different biotypes of, of Sangiovese. Um, and they're used, they're all used in different amounts. There are ones that have different names. There are ones that have like technical names. Um, and the important part to remember of 
um, of Vino Nobile is you do not have to, where Brunello has to be 100% Sangiovese Grosso, you do not have to be 100% Prugnolo Gentile uh, in, in Montepulciano. You can actually use 25% of other grapes. Tre Rose does not because uh, their focus, their solar f only focus is on the Prugnolo Gentile. And this is the vineyard up here in the right hand corner. It looks like an amphitheater. Yep. Beautiful. Yeah, so, th so they're doing a lot of cool things. Uh, that's uh, Pietro Rico Buono, who's on the left, who is actually, of all things, he's Sicilian. He's actually from Noto, uh, very, very good friend. And he handles all the, all the agricultural aspects of um, not only um, Tre Rose, but also Val di Suga and then also Bertani. And that's an ancient well right there. That is ancient. Yep. Cool. So, here, so there you get to see the the uh, another view of the amphitheater. They're they're doing some really cool things. He 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 spoke about the organic certification that they'll they'll be getting, uh, but they're also doing this uh, IPIC technology, which is basically this kind of way of micromanaging the vineyards with um, with sensors that you know let you know basically um, all the soil conditions. Also, they have uh, drones that monitor the vineyards where they can go in and really kind of take specific parts of the vineyard um, and see when the picking needs to be. So they're, do they're, they're, they're putting in a, an organic touch, but they're also adding a touch of modern uh, technology to their winemaking and their agriculture. Yeah, beautifully picturesque. There's no question about it. There you can see the large Slavonian casks, the typical Tuscan fog with the cypress trees and the rolling hills. Awesome. We just kind of slide down the hill towards Montalcino. Yeah. Right into our number five wine. I always think it's perfect that separating Montepulciano and Montalcino, you, you basically have um, the... Um, a region for that go, that specializes in in sheep's milk cheese. So each one of the regions can uh, access the sheep's milk cheese at uh, at any time. And, th and th I will say that this is another wine that just is singing tonight. This uh, Tre Rose is just really in a good spot in the glass, um, and really has the. Kind of, I, I, it really shows you the difference that place can make because it is Sangiovese. But we're about to move into uh, Montalcino. Um, in night one, we had Spinazzi. Um, and you know you're drinking Italian, you know you're drinking red, you know you're drinking Sangiovese, but you can really identify place. And this just has that kind of silty, sandy soil that softens the mouthfeel a little bit, gives it just a little bit of that, that kind of rusticity that is uh, um, Montepulciano. Really a beautiful version. Mm. Um, and now we're going to move into the largest organic ranch in, is it Italy or all of Europe? In Tuscany. Tuscany, okay. But one of the largest in Italy. And and our host here is uh, of royal uh, descent, right? Yep, this is the Count Francisco Cinsano. So he is literally the first cousin of the King of Spain. Greetings from Cordorcia. Greetings from Montalcino, where we produce the Brunello di Montalcino. I am standing in one of my Sangiovese grape vineyards. Sangiovese grape is the grape we use to produce Brunello di Montalcino. And uh, I came to check the ripening of the grapes. I picked this bunch to uh, analyze it and uh, judge the point of uh, ripeness but I've been tasting the grapes they are ready probably tomorrow morning we will come and pick them for the Brunello di Montalcino 2020 but now I want to present to you the Coldorcia Brunello di Montalcino vintage 2015 this wine was produced with grapes uh, such as these ones in fact this vineyard uh, as well 
all vineyards that uh, I grow myself, they are all farmed uh, organically and they deliver balanced fruit, harmonious fruit that will uh, produce a balanced wine and a harmonious wine. This 2015, uh, after picking the grapes, was brought to the cellar and we uh, aged it for full three years in large oak barrels to uh, allow it to mellow and uh, uh, amalgamate uh, and uh, uh, really become ready uh, to be enjoyed by you. I poured myself uh, a glass of it and uh, if we look at the color of this Brunello di Montalcino called Dorcia 2015, we can see that the, it's quite light, it's quite transparent, uh, with a nice uh, ruby red and uh, orangey, orangey sides that uh, indicate the amount of aging uh, that this wine has already undergone. To the nose, it is uh, elegant and complex. You can uh, uh, feel the uh, cherries, the sour cherries, also spices and uh, dried fruit. To the taste, it's uh, balanced, it's uh, filling in the mouth, it's uh, very persistent, it has a pleasant um, fruity side to it, uh, very long aftertaste, uh, bright, uh, and really makes you think about food. So I start thinking when I taste this wine uh, of how I'm going to pair it uh, with food and uh, looking forward uh, today at lunch uh, to a wild boar stew that I will cook using some Rosso di Montalcino, the younger version of, of this wine. So a full flavored dish, nice and rich, but I can also think of uh, uh, lamb cutlets, for instance, or a fillet with green pepper sauce. So full flavored dishes, uh, uh, because this is a wine that can withstand uh, uh, a very uh, important comparison uh, in terms of pairing with food. I'm also looking forward to taste this wine uh, in a little bit longer uh, so that it has a chance to age more in the bottle and it will uh, keep improving. So Brunello di Montalcino 2015 by Cordorcia. Good health to you all. I think he's got a great uh... Uh, camera manner, uh, Orson Welles and Santa Claus, just kind of like a perfect cross there. I, I always joke with the Count because we, we do call him the Count, okay. and uh, and the I always joke with him that he's the most interesting man. Yes. And if you see the the like press pictures of Coldorcha, and then he also has a property. He has an amazing organic vineyard in Chile, in the south of Chile. Um, called Erasmo and I always if you see the pictures of him it's always of him riding a horse or with like a traditional Chilean hat with a cigar in his mouth uh, truly the most interesting man perfect mm -hmm. but I will tell you guys that there is the reason why I work for the company that I do is because of Coldorcha uh, if it was not for my love of Coldorcha I would have never met the importer i would have never met the people behind the scenes that's how much i love this wine and uh michael and i did a zoom earlier like last year with the the, the 19 or the 2004 vintage that we have a, a maybe a case left of um so you have a choice uh of buying some 04 or buying this 15er um these wines age like giants that they are and uh we, we love both the vintages. 15 is an incredible vintage for uh, Brunello de Montalcino. And this is a just a really, really important brand for the region. And uh, really a slow aging wine, very classic in its, in its style. There are producers now that are making them riper and putting more wood on them and doing a lot of what we would consider modern winemaking. This is definitely classic in its winemaking style. And, and really uh, um, slow aging wine. I, I had a great question. I, mean, I think it was when, when you, you and I, Ian, were together 
and a cust- and one of the one of the people on the call was like, you know, he, he was very honest. He's I'm a whiskey drinker. Um, I tend to like Brunello's other producers of Brunello better, like Casanova di Neri, um, Valdi Cava. Um, and, and it was, it was good. It was something that I was really pleased for someone to point out. Um, there are different styles of Brunello. This tends to be a very traditional style. There's no new oak, there's no barriques. You're not getting that vanillin, like if you had a whiskey palette that you would, that you would look for. Um, but it's a very traditional style. It's a style that ages very well and very slowly. Um, it's it's a wine that takes time and and you need to to sit on uh, but that time is well rewarded in the future and it is a food wine it is something you know we we all should uh, look forward to the the wild boar stew that we're gonna have at lunch but uh you know it's it is a food wine well we'll definitely plan a future trip to brunello and visit the count mm-hmm. absolutely um, and uh, that, that would be an amazing experience. Now, you, you collect this wine yourself, right? Is that what you were saying? Because I, I remember yep. talking about how many different vintages of this wine you had. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't think the last vintage I had, we had, oh, I know what it was. We, uh, the other day we had, I was with Sal Marino and we had a, we had a bottle of 1977. Oh. Um, and, it, and it was beautiful. It was, it was absolutely spectacular. We opened it actually for my birthday. Um, but I've, I've had the 75 recently, which was wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, the 04 that you have, you know, 04, 15, 16 are all really, really top vintages. And 04 is probably my favorite vintage, I will say, probably in the last 20 years. So if you have an opportunity and a means to, to pick up those bottles, I would. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they're not out of reach. I mean, they're really a good value proposition for a 16-year-old Brunello that's got 94 points and really is just a, a, a great benchmark example of a great vintage. But so is this 15. 15 mm -hmm. is uh, the current great vintage. 16s will come out next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, these wines require five years before they're released. So that's why current vintage is 15. Um, and then, uh, gosh, the question is, how long would you age it for? People have a hard time keeping, you know, the average bottle of wine is bought and drank the, in the same day. Mm -hmm. So people have a hard time keeping their corkscrew away from this bottle, but it does benefit this bottle to be in the cellar for many years. And, uh, you know, Brunello is a great collectible. So you can lay these down and if you go to uh, Maltocino with me. We'll go to visit wineries, and we've been offered a chance to, to drink some of these older wines. You know, 78, 82, 1990. Uh, these are great vintages in the history of Brunello. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's there's some great restaurants that have verticals of cold orch on the menu. I really invite you to go to some and, and try them out. I mean, Spago is one, but uh, Paponi is another. Uh, Drago Chantro is another one that has amazing old vintages of Cold Orcha. Um, and these wines, you know, it's give them time in the bottle, but also give them time in the glass because they do benefit by being in the glass or being in a decanter for at least an hour. We'll have to plan a future vertical dinner with just Cold Orcha, dude. That would be amazing. But uh... Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I know Drago Chantro has, I mean, Mark... You know, and now you have Piero Savaggio over there, and, and they would love to do something like that. Yeah, how's Piero doing at uh, Drago Centro? Oh, he's amazing. He is a force of nature, to yeah. say the least. Yeah, yeah if you haven't, uh, if you want a good Italian restaurant experience, go visit Piero Savaggio from Valentino. He's now at Drago Centro in downtown LA, and uh, tell him uh, Ian and Michael sent you. Absolutely. So if you look at a map of uh, Maltocino and it, Brunello is the wine, you know, this is one of the like major collectibles in the wine world uh, in today's world. Um, and something weird happened with the pandemic. The, these wines became more affordable. 
They were on their way towards a hundred dollars a bottle. Every every Brunello was shooting up the charts, and maybe because we had two great vintages in a in a row, and we lost every restaurant in in the world. Um, the, there's a good good amount of wine to sell. These guys make a lot of wine for the world, and they hold it five years to get it into the market, into the stream. So um, these wines are more affordable today than they were two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't care which one you look at on the map here. They're they're just this is an amazing place to buy wine. In fact, hedge funds have been trying to buy this vineyard space because this has got the highest average bottle price of any region in the world. More expensive than um, on the average bottle. Brunello is close to 50 bucks a bottle on average. And so the, the hedge fund world said, we, we want to invest. And <laughs> land's been in a lot of, under a lot of pressure. And give it a month or two and you will have an opportunity to buy 2015's very inexpensive because in about a month, I know we have our 2016 on the water and distributors, you know, once the new vintage lands, they love to do a fire sale of the old vintage. So there might be some nice opportunities if you guys uh, keep your eyes and ears out. Cool. Well, the price that we have on this wine uh, for these people here is is a lot less than I would have anticipated. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there'll be some downward pressure if the 16s arrive and, and this is a big ranch so you guys make a lot of wine mm -hmm. uh, but uh the the opportunity to, to put these wines away is really really the special opportunity you have because you'll be able to count on this a decade from now 20 years from now or even just two years from now and it is not uh, this is not unapproachable this is enjoyable now mm -hmm and just you know give it a good decanting that's all and buy more than one bottle you know buy buy a couple bottles put a couple away and 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 see how it develops over time that's the real joy so um we'll have to watch how the you know the health curve goes but uh you know my business i've taken people to italy um many different parts of italy and we are trying to do something as soon as we possibly can because no country got harder with COVID than it and uh, wow. I'd love to, to have you join me on a trip no matter where we go it's going to be amazing and there's you know everybody goes and they try to squeeze in you know five pounds of experiences into a three pound trip um, because that's where we are but we we really do it right we, turn, we get, go to great restaurants. They're not all Michelin stars, but great restaurants in Italy shouldn't have that. You shouldn't go to Michelin star restaurants in Italy. You should go to like the, the local great places and, uh, and, and just enjoy the local, most local cuisine and the hand, you know, the smaller spots are just so good. That's, those are, those are amazing casks. Yeah. Gives you an idea. Those are three, basically three sizes. You got the bariks, you got the the large casks, and then you have a medium cask, which is really interesting. They they use that a lot in the Brunello as well. Um, and let me just talk for a second about this, in case you don't know. When you put the wine in here in this regular barrel, the the uh, percentage of wood uh, it's very high. So the impact is pretty high. So they tend to use probably slightly older barrels at this size, but you get a lot of evaporation. When you go to this size, you got a little bit less. And this, these barrels up here, I looking at them, I wouldn't be surprised if these aren't 30 plus years old up here. Yeah. And they can be a hundred year old barrels. And, and same with these big giant mothers. They, they literally do not impart any wood character at all what they do is they allow for a very slow maturation really slow it down and um but there is some and there's some um air penetration and it's just like a really cool slow you know it's, italy came out with a, a movement i don't know it's probably 20 years ago now slow food 
They wanted to remind people to slow down, have dinner at the table, drink some wine, have conversation, and just slow it down. Because everything in, from America was fast food. Mm -hmm. and they, so they wanted to slow it down with slow food. And, uh, and the whole concept of their winemaking is slow it down. Slow it down mm -hmm. and, and uh, let the time, you know, kind of tell the story. And that's why, you know, one of the things, too, I mentioned to you guys about the aging of wine is, you know, uh, these wines, you know, I'm not saying don't drink them now because, you know, that, that would destroy my my industry and my business. But these wines really do improve with age and they do show characteristics and complexity um, that you don't get by drinking them young. say just a couple more hellos melvin j i hope you've enjoyed thanks for joining us on both nights good to see you again see you sir cindy i hope you enjoyed thank you so much good talking with you cindy molo yes thank you uh i enjoyed it very much and i dragged many of my neighbors here so hopefully mm -hmm. they enjoyed it as well fantastic alina are you part of her neighbors could see you smile when she said I am. <laughs> I am I'm sitting across the table from her. Ah, that's uh that explains a lot. All right. Oh, okay. Amber okay. Amber and Jordan, how are you guys? Doing well. Jordan stepped away, but this has been fantastic. Thank you. Hector, you guys doing okay, buddy? Amazing. Uh, as usual again. Thank you for bringing us all together. Yes. Delicious stuff. Thank you, Hector. I want to hear from Terry's group. What did you guys have for dinner over there? Oh, Ian, were you talking to me? It's Terry. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> yeah, we um, we actually went to Pasta Sisters for dinner. Ah. In LA, and got a bunch of different stuff and shared it amongst ourselves. So uh, yeah, we had a we had a good spread today. Cool. And it went I very like well with the wines. Thank you so much. I like Pasta Sisters. That's a good restaurant. Where is that? There's two of them now. There's one in Culver City, but I think the original one was like Adams District over by USC. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's actually, you know, Luciano Busola? I don't. Who used to be at Vias for many years. Oh, oh, Luciano, yeah. Yeah, it's his nephew. Oh, wow. How cool. Yeah, yeah so we, we went to their little storefront in uh, off Pico that's closer to me oh good guys really really good guys great food mm -hmm. authentic yep. yeah Michael, I, have a, I have a quick question for you oh, sure. great go um everything we've tasted tonight was a hundred percent of a certain varietal and um in in regards to whether you know obviously in bordeaux there's Bordeaux blend is is there any any vineyards that have combined your Biello with a Sangiovese with uh, with a, a sense of three or four different varietals in one particular vintage and if if so which what what, what is it and if not why don't they do that uh, I'll throw my two cents in first and then Michael go for it if you got anything mm -hmm. to cover first you're talking about really different cultures between like Tuscany and Piedmont. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Different. The, the people look different. Uh, I mean, it's really, uh, even though they're all part of Italy, Italy's only 150 years old, 170 years old. And so they don't, they don't mess around with, uh, other people's grape varieties too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Sangiovese is very much a Tuscan grape and Nebbiolo is very much a Piedmontese grape. Um, and so I, I, I'm sure that uh, in California, somebody's playing around with those blends, with the Italian wine blends, grape variety blends, but you don't see much of it in Italy. Now, in Tuscany, of course, they make a lot of super Tuscan blends, but those are usually using modern varieties like Cabernet, Merlot, Cab Franc, stuff like that. They're not using, they're not going outside of the Tuscan boundary and using other Italian varieties. Mm -hmm. What do you think? No, I, I think that's a very good point. You know, I understand the grapes from Northern Italy came uh, continental. They came through France and they came through Switzerland and Austria and then down into 
into northern Italy, whether it's the Alto Adige, even as, even as far as Tuscany. Uh, the the next wine we're going to have Master Berardino. Those grapes are, are originally Greek in descent, so those came from a completely different direction. Um, you have me, people like me that I'm dark. You know, I could be Persian, I could be Armenian in another sense, I could be, uh, you know, you name it, any Mediterranean culture. Um, you know, in fact, my mom has jewelry with uh, with a Saracen sword. Uh, that was traditional jewelry from my family because somewhere along the line we were probably of Saracen descent in some way or another. Um, and then you see someone like Cinzia Travellini, who's blonde, blue eyes. You know, she it looks like she's uh, from Switzerland. So you know that's part of it. Another part of it is is you do have blends. Uh, Chianti 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 Classico tends to be a blend. Um, you do have like Cherizuola di Vittoria from Sicily tends to be a blend, or it has to be a blend. Um, in Alto Adige, you have these ble white blends that are so famous. You do have it, um, but you know, you also, there is a pleasure and there is a quality of purity of fruit and that you only really get from mono varietals. So in order to say, okay, we're, we're assessing the, the Prugnolo Gentile, so we're going to assess the Prugnolo Gentile as a mono varietal. They will add complexity to that by blending different vineyards, particularly you see that in Tuscany, um, in, in the County Classico region. That why me personally, I am not a fan of single vineyard wines from Italy. I just, I, I think it, it loses um, complexity, uh, which was why they were there for. You see a, ter a terroir aspect, yes you do, but um, but you can add complexity by blending vineyards um, and, and assessing different ripening. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a conversation could probably open up to several side conversations, but I, I, think, uh, I think what Ian mentioned, and also I think being able to assess the purity of fruit and assess it as a mono varietal is, is, uh, has a redeeming quality to it. Cool. Well, we're going to go to uh, a, a wine that I'm, I'm hoping everybody just falls in love with tonight. It's the grape Aglianico. And Aglianico is an, a super important ancient variety. As uh, Michael said, it's a Greek in origin um, or maybe brought to Italy from Greece or from the eastern side of uh, Europe. But it became kind of the grape of, uh, of, a, of an era and it's still with us and it's still very important but these are beasts of wines these are like the biggest like you know um my uh my 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 grandfather used to feed me stuff and say here eat this it'll put hair on your chest i don't know if you've <laughs> heard that before but uh this is a this is a wine that, that could put hair on your chest so uh, let's try a little Aglianico from uh, Mastro Bernardino. This is uh, the area is known as Terrazzi and uh, the grape uh, or the bottle, the bottling is the Radici. <laughs> and we'll listen now. Go ahead and uh, okay. give me one. No, I was, just gonna, I was just gonna give you guys a brief introduction to the wine areas that uh, you know, Mastro Berardino is, is probably the most historically important wine of Campania. It was one of the first wines, Italian wines, imported into the United States, even as, as far back as the turn of the century. Um, and there are a few wineries that you can say, if not for them, a grape would not exist. And in the case of Mastro Berardino, there would be two grapes that would not exist if it was not for them and them preserving it. One is Alianico, which is the root grape of Taurasi, which you guys are having. And then the other grape that they famously preserved is Greco di Tufo. And I don't know if you guys have had Greco di Tufo, um, but with summer coming up, it's an amazingly uh, delicious, crisp white wine uh, from, from basically the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. So you have wines that are, have a, a, a large degree of minerality uh, in Campania. And that's one of the things that Campania is really famous for. So Campania is, is the region of Naples. Uh, I am Neapolitan and uh, we identify ourselves as Neapolitan. We don't identify ourselves as Italian. We are Neapolitan first. Most years we root for the Argentinian soccer team and not the Italian team. 
So I'll give you guys uh, the context of that. Um, but uh, Master Veradino is hugely important. Uh, on the label, it says 1878, but the winery actually goes well back into the 1600s. Uh, the winery was originally in Avellino, and then in 1878, they transported the winery to the little town called Atripalda, uh, which is just east of the city of Naples. So if you go from the city of Naples, which literally sits on the shores of the Mediterranean, and you go eastbound, you go over Mount Vesuvius, you go over the Apennine Mountains, and then you find yourself kind of in the middle of a mountainous region called Irpinia, which is where you'll find Taurasi. And here we go. The ancient Greek grape that was brought in southern Italy by the Greeks um, during the period of the colonization under Magna Grecia. Um, and uh, it's a uh, one of the most important red lines that we have in our country and this label particularly is one of the ambassadors of the Italian wine movement in the world. Radici is a, a, a name that was given by my father in the 80s um, and uh, is a symbol of our production. It's, it's made of uh, uh, a selection of grapes coming from two different family sites. One is in Mirabella and the other is in Monte Marano. Since the origin, there was this blend that uh, is particularly in interesting and intriguing because uh, the two sites are different. Mirabella is a little more hilly and with a little lower average uh, uh, elevation. And uh, uh, Monte Marano is colder, is higher, is in a mountain side, and so uh, with a higher discussion of temperature between night and day, with a harder, darker character. Uh, at the end, uh, we have a, a, a perfect balance between these two souls, two different expressions of the terroir of Taurasi, with a wine that has a period of maturation that is, uh, um, and the harvest year is uh, in late October, beginning of November. So uh, after the harvest, uh, we have a period of maceration that is quite long, about 25 days. And uh, um, after this, we have uh, in the cellar a period of wood refining that goes from 24 up to 30 months, uh, mainly in big casks. And a small percentage goes through French barriques. Then after this period, there is a, a long, period of refining in the bottle that is strategic, extremely important for a wine like this. It has a beautiful character of uh, violet at the nose and cherry that are typical descriptors of, uh, of uh, Taurasi, but also lots of spices and very long and persistent taste and uh, uh, nice complexity, the elegance and finesse that is very typical of the mountain wines of Irpinia. I hope you enjoy Radici Taurasi. Well, that was found on YouTube, actually. They imported that for us. So, uh, let's see. Boom, boom. Yeah, I think all our wineries actually put, I'm pretty sure they put all the videos they recorded for this on YouTube as well. Um, and we'll share, we'll share one more where he's speaking Italian and mm -hmm kind of just show off the the region i want you to just check out these amazing uh yeah uh, so hills. so uh, Turn off your little piano. <laughs> Mastro Berardino, che mi onoro di rappresentare, è una famiglia del vino eh, che per dieci generazioni ha operato nello stesso territorio, con la stessa viticoltura, con eh, gli stessi vitigni e gli stessi vini. Una storia lunga di... Eh... So, just a, a super amazing piece of property with a lot yeah. of history. And uh, there's some other pictures that are just going to take your breath away here. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the wine does that as well. This is just such a, a giant, such a beast, and so, so, uh, it, it's so tender at the same time. And I love how spicy, how, you know, the tannins are just ready to rip onto the food that you're about to eat. 
And uh, is there something traditionally Tarazian that's food from down there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say, you know, if, uh, you know, truly this is inland food from Campania. So you're looking at a stuff, a lot of stuff like lamb and goat. Um, you don't particularly just have just a ton. South of Rome, right? Just south of Rome. Well, so south and then inland. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is almost, almost as far east as Molise or out towards the Molise region. You're kind of in central, the central part of the country in terms of east-west. Let me stop the video right here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll back up a second here. And look at that mountain right behind there. Is that, that's Vesuvius right there, right? Yep, that's Vesuvio. And this is, uh, this vineyard here is a, a, a really important vineyard site from the, the back then. Yep, so that is the Villa of the Mysteries or Villa Mysteri uh, that it's called. It's the, so the Villa Mysteri is a world heritage site that they asked Piero Master Berardino to be the caretaker of. And basically it is the original vineyards of Pompeii. Um, and they worked with, um, with Master Berardino to really recreate it to exactly, even down to the agricultural, the methods of agriculture that are used to recreate the vineyard. Uh, it's a blend of Arianico, Shashinoso, and Piriroso. Um, and uh, it, it's quite exquisite. The wines are exquisite. You know, usually they run about $199 in there. I think Italy is probably the only retailer that carries it. Uh, but the wines are really unique and, and uh, unlike anything you've ever had before. So I do invite you to try those. And, and all the proceeds of those, of those wines go to uh, the preservation of the Pompeii ruins. Hmm. Well, we're looking at these vineyards, you know, probably November. Um, yeah. Maybe even December. I'm not yeah, sure. I would even say December because the, the everyone thinks of Campania as being really hot and it's it's really not a hot region. In fact, Irpinia, uh, the region where you find Taurasi is one of the coldest regions and it's actually one of the last uh, regions to be picked and last regions to go through harvest. So, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you know, wines from Southern Italy, they're going to be hot and they're going to be, uh, you know, high in alcohol. And that's not the case. Well, this wine is just super stunning. It's another great Aglianico. And there are many uh, very good producers, but this is this brand, Master Bernardino, is definitely the ambassadorial brand of Italy. The, the name, the history, the commitment, the, 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 their scale. Um, mm -hmm. And then Radici, this wine that we're tasting tonight is the best wine uh, or uh, the, 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 the biggest ambassador of, of the Aglianico, their, their major wine, I should say. There's certainly some single vineyards, some of these older sites and uh, plots that, as you said, go for quite a bit of money. This one's not inexpensive, but from a value proposition, this is a, an incredible value proposition because of what it is and how good it is and how many awards it's won and how representative it is. Mm -hmm. You guys can see the seller there. Um, and not only of Taurasi, but also of Fiano. Fiano is a white grape that also tends to age very, very well. Um, and a couple of things I will say to you guys is that a couple of years ago, wine enthusiasts did a cover picture that said the icons of Italian wine. And they picked out the eight most important Italian wines. Um, and one of them was, one of them was Gaia Barbaresco, one was Salsicaia, one was Ornolaia, and one was Bertani Amarone. And last but not least, you had Master Berardino, um, Master Berardino Radici because in their mind it was one of, and, and in my mind certainly, it's one of the most important wines in, in Italy. The second thing I will tell you guys is considered the, the greatest Italian bottle of wine ever made is the 1968 Radici. Um, it is that well regarded uh, amongst collectors in terms of winemaking and, and how those wines age. Uh, for Christmas this year, we had the, the pleasure of opening a bottle of 1977 Reserva. And 
it was young. It took about an hour and a half to two hours to open up. And it was remarkably good, remarkably good. Hmm. And there's Vesuvius in the background again. Mm -hmm. This picture is just stunning. Um, yeah, it's a point of reference. And uh, there's that vineyard, that historical vineyard. Uh, and these are, th this is just like amazingly ancient ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the Pompeii ruins in the background. And, and also, I will say this, people tend to um, mistakenly think that Taurasi is a wine to drink with pizza. And yeah, it, it comes from the same region, but I will say that this wine is a wine that, it, that wants something complex, whether it's a piece of meat or a braised, uh, braised dish. Um, you know, it, 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 it certainly can stand up with a, an important meal in a restaurant. Yeah, I, what would you have tonight, Michael, if you were cooking? Uh, I had leftover Chinese food, but that's not, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, but, uh, what would you, what you, would know, you with it? my ideal would be, you know, especially this time of year, uh, braised, braised lamb, um, you know, even with like polenta with pecorino cheese in it. Um, I would also have it with a piece of roast meat with a sauce. Um, you know, even even something like uh, like grilled short ribs with chimichurri sauce would even be fantastic. Could you go? I mean, that's from a different region, but something like an osobuco. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there. I mean, there are there are equivalents of uh, you know uh, veal shank that are made in southern Italy as well. But yeah, you want that level of complexity in the dish. You don't just want to a piece of meat, you know, a, a grilled, you know, a hamburger. I mean, even a hammer, a good hamburger could even hold the test. But, you know, you don't want a piece of pizza or something like that. You, you want something with a little bit more complexity. So there's the bottle. Um, and uh, 24 months, French oak, barrique, mm -hmm. and Slovenian cask. And then 24 months of refinement in bottle. So. This wine's f almost five years old when it's released. Our vintage tonight's 2016. Great vintage, incredible. And the wine is just a rock star. Love it. Again, if, if you see that Radici Taurasi has an aging potential of 50 years or more. <laughs> it is, I will tell you guys, it's very interesting that they think Alianico is actually derived potentially from Syrah. Um, and there were some cases that they found grapes that were basically like missing links between Syrah and Alianico. So likely what was brought from Greece was Syrah. And then over time it morphed into Alianico. Or when you say Greece, you mean like the Greek empire? Because oh, yeah. probably, it was probably Iran and, uh, you know, the East, the whole Middle East. Uh, area that all these grape varieties kind of converge from during, you know, eras, eras of past important. Yeah. Well, they say the cycle, if you guys read the Odyssey and there's the, the episode with the Cyclops and they say that that was probably in Naples. Wonderful family, wonderful, wonderful family. <laughs> who, who else has a couch in their vineyard? <laughs> I like the young daughter that says the future on her t-shirt. That's good. Yeah. They, they're, he, he is an amazing man and, and very, very approachable, very receptive. If you guys follow him on Instagram and shoot him, him notes, he's always eager to answer and, uh, and, uh, just a gentleman. What is, uh, his Instagram on the chat? Oh yeah. Let me, let me get it. And this is some uh, beautiful um, paintings that are featured on the bottle as well of the, the, the single vineyard, right? Yeah, so that, those are actually the frescoes in the Villa di Misteri. Um, and it portrays Dionysus um, and, you know, obviously some drunken... Uh, um, Whatever goes, whatever happens in Dionysus, his house stays in Dionysus itself. <laughs> Very cool. All right, so I'm going to put it, it's just Piero Master Berardino. Awesome. 
Well, uh, everyone's probably already received an email from us called the gift bag email. And if you didn't, just email me and I'll send it to you. Um, but uh, if you're not on our mailing list or you've blocked our emails, which it happens because we send a lot of email, um, then you won't get the gift bag because it will get blocked. But uh, you, you know, send me an email and I'll get it to you. And uh, that, that has, um, you know, look at the, all the different prices that we're offering tonight. These uh, wines are uh, really close to my cost on that email tonight. You have 24 hours to be able to buy these wines at that price. Um, you do get an additional 5% off on any six bottle assortment. You get 10% off on any 12, 12 bottle assortment. Um, and we would shoot to deliver on Tuesday if we have stock. Um, if we don't, we'll get, get it as we can. But um, the, these wines are just a really great opportunity to be able to stock up on some benchmark, really top quality stuff. That uh, um, thank Michael for his time tonight and being able to pull this together for us and all the, the video assets and and uh, it's a real challenging wine for us in the wine world to be able to do stuff like this because the 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 wine world's you know the distributors have. They basically laid everybody off about about a year ago, and now they're trying to open back up. And uh, the wine business has actually done very, very well through the retail channels, but all the restaurants are opening right now. So now they're hiring staff and the rest and the distributors are just absolutely maxed out. So it's really a challenge. And Michael's working 20 hours a day to keep up. He's got a lot of things happening. <laughs> And uh, we'll leave it at that. But the, uh, yep, I'm really, it's exciting at the same time. But um, uh, this is a, this is a golden moment because I think when the reality of where we're at touches the cost of the bottles and the cost of labor and the cost, of the, the pricing that we're looking at in today's wine world is not really connected to reality. And when that reality starts to touch these these wines, all wines, by the way, I see pretty um, aggressive price increases coming down the pipe. Now, Michael mentioned, you know, uh, because the restaurants are just starting to buy and uh, the distributors have, you know, to move on to the new vintages, they have to. The winders can't hold these wines. So what they do is they'll release the the older vintages so there, there's just like kind of a strange friction that'll happen but uh, the, the, there will be some pretty interesting pricing scenarios happening quite quickly the dollar's been weakened a little bit there's there was some pressure from taxes that's kind of been relieved for a little bit but uh, as, as you're seeing in all grocery items everything in the grocery store is going up and it's not long until all that hits the wine industry and it, it will be pretty significant when it happens. With that, uh, I, I don't wanna be all bad news. It's a great time to be a wine buyer. There's so many good deals to be able to ha be had. And I hope you guys will take advantage of some of the opportunities tonight. And I hope you guys will uh, continue to do the Zooms with us. We are going to stay on Zoom for all of 2021. Uh, we've got uh, weekly Zooms on Wednesdays and Saturdays. We've got uh, STARS events once a month planned till the end of the year. We have our STARS of white wine coming up that uh, you may have seen an ad for today. Uh, just absolutely stunning wines that we've been able to work with. Next month, we've got the STARS of Rosé, and then the month after that, STARS of Pinot Noir. And uh, we want to continue to show this really abundance of great quality and uh, and it's really about showing diversity and um, you know, covering a lot of, of, of ground and being able to taste a wide assortment of different ideas of, on, on, on great wines. So that's what we've got in store for us. And the, and the calendar continues after July. We're working on events right now in August, September, October, November, December. And uh, so it's exciting for us here. We thank you for your support of the event tonight. If any of you had any problems, we'll 
hope to work through them uh, on the back side of this it's not easy to get all all of uh, the 100 people across the finish line at the same time but we do everything we can the delivery services are a, a real challenge for us that's why we deliver ourselves with a courier in los angeles um and uh we, we do our best. We are really do. We work really hard and spend a long, long time as a team talking about every single detail. I hope you enjoyed the, the emails that we sent out and the preparation and the tasting mats and the tasting notes and uh, all that stuff too. It's all there for you. We'll send up uh, some more emails later with uh, some assets. Some the, Those of you that wanted to watch those videos and be able to hear them. Um, I'll make sure you have links to those. We'll put it all together and get it out to you. Probably will be tomorrow, by the way, that I'll get that all out for the videos. But um, we will get those to you. And uh, thank you very much for your time tonight, everybody. Peace, love, and understanding to everyone. And uh, have a great weekend.